Over half of adults in the U.S. drink coffee every day. That's 150 million cups of coffee. Coffee is everywhere we look. It wakes us up in the morning. It closes out a nice meal. It keeps college students buzzing at all times through the night. But how many of us know where our coffee comes from? As you sip your morning latte, do you stop to think about who picked those beans? How many hands they pass through to get from that farmer to your cup? Do you stop to consider your inherently privileged role as the consumer of global goods? The sheer number and availability of once novel agricultural and manufactured goods constantly within our grasp is a direct product of neoliberal policies over the past 50 years. Free trade emerged as the unchallenged economic paradigm alongside institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, and agreements like NAFTA and the single European market, all promoting the absence of any state intervention in markets, especially in the global commodity chain. But with these neoliberal policies, we've seen the rise of profit-seeking transnational corporations and powerful private enterprises. We've seen an increase in exploitative labor and modern-day slavery, and fatal consequences to biodiversity and natural resources around the world. And we've seen a staggering increase in wealth disparity and global inequality. The systems that we've conceived of as of now are just fundamentally exploitive to people and to environments. You know, we've built such an incredibly complicated web that there's a fundamental disconnect between people and places that are producing and people and places that are consuming, whether that's the, what is commonly referred to as the global south and the global north or global east and west or even in our own backyards. We're very blind to all the things that are around us and where they come from and the cost that is incurred in those things. We better change some things real soon or I'm worried about my kids and, and the kids that come after them. We, we need to change something. Most of us have probably heard of fair trade. But what do we really know about it? I went to Sprouts, a local organic health food store that sells fair trade coffee, and asked some consumers what they knew of the movement. Very little. It sounds like a good thing, yeah. fair trade, as opposed to unfair trade. I hadn't even seen it kind of advertised mm -hmm. widely or whatever. I wouldn't know mm -hmm. what I was buying, to be honest with you. I buy it more for the ingredients in something. A girlfriend of mine said, oh, they have the best quality stuff. So it's like, okay, we'll try it. Uh, cool. Generally, word of mouth. We buy a variety of coffees, mm -hmm. but we buy quite a bit from Green Mountain through mail order. And most of their stuff, we understand, is fair trade. And um, it's just those, uh, the fair trade, we understand, really helps the people in the regions that grow the coffee. They're the ones doing all the work. In the 1980s, um, Mexican coffee farmers who were working in cooperatives um, started sort of organizing to figure out ways to push back on the forces of neoliberal globalization. Um, they found themselves unable to really bargain with the large transnational buyers in the coffee industry. Um, you know, companies like Sara Lee, Nestle, craft even who buy the vast majority of the world's coffee and distribute it to a variety of companies and labels. Um, those are really huge powerful actors and for farmers it's who are small actors it's difficult to push back on them and demand fair prices. So they started to think about how can we work together um, basically to create an alternative market. Um, and with the help of some actually Dutch priests initially, um, they helped found the um, Dutch model of Max Havelaar. And fair trade in the US and internationally kind of grew out of that model. Um, and what it meant was that farmers came together in cooperatives, so small producers with maybe just a hectare of land to themselves um, who farm their coffee themselves would get together with the people who also farmed in their region and they would um, work through a cooperative mill or a cooperative exporter to match up with buyers who had become a part of the fair trade system. Fair trade is about 
guaranteeing a minimum price per pound of coffee sold and guarantee and also so not just guaranteeing the floor price in terms of making it a fair price but making it a stable price a price that they know that they can count on in the long term in the fair trade kind of as an idea, as a movement, is about is not tied to anything specific. It's not tied to a company. It's not tied, or not a company, an organization. Um, it's not tied to one specific label. It's kind of looking at the way most trade is conducted now and saying that's unfair. <laughs> and how are we going to conceive of something that isn't exploitive to both the people and the environments where these goods are produced? Fair trade, in that sense, is just making people aware that every choice that we make has an impact probably somewhere really far away from us that is not one that we would be in support of if we were confronted with it face to face. Um, and then there's fair trade as kind of the labeling body um, and there's several different bodies but um, fair trade either capital F space capital T or all one word are um, different organizations that have a kind of model that they um, have, you know, different criteria, and then they have a third-party auditor who kind of audits their participating groups, whether those are cooperatives, independent farmers, plantations, um, based on those criteria. And they are then either given a seal of approval and said, you can package your things with this label that says fair trade, or you can't. Generally, the, there's a, a price floor that is higher than the market price, Generally, there are requirements um, about where that um, price for that like margin, that extra money, where that has to be invested in the community. Generally, there are environmental stipulations um, and on rules about labor practices, such as no child labor and all those things. Like any marketed commodity, there is a gap between what promotional materials for fair trade promise and its reality. While fair trade is said to guarantee a living wage to coffee farmers, it instead guarantees a minimum price to the cooperatives or organization of producers, and the money is often still not enough. It can also be extremely difficult for farmers to enter the fair trade market. There are fees, stipulations, and other barriers to entry, which make it difficult for some marginalized farmers to become fair trade certified at all. There are also a limited number of fair trade contracts available. And to export fair trade, coffee farmers often must also be certified organic, a process which can be incredibly expensive and can last up to three years. Fair Trade USA decided to expand the fair trade certification system beyond the scope of uh, cooperatives of small producers to include large-scale plantations. Um, they, they've expanded it in such a way that it can also include small-scale farms that are not a part of a cooperative, which is definitely good for those small farmers who maybe are isolated or for whom a cooperative doesn't work. Um, it, it includes them in the system. It also includes medium-sized estates. Um, but there's a lot of controversy about the inclusion of large-scale plantations um, who already have a competitive advantage on the market. Um, and so there's been controversy around the implications of that for small-scale farmers. One of the key cons, and this comes mostly from the industry, from folks I've interviewed in my research, is that fair trade does not emphasize quality. There's a newer model that's emerged recently that's referred to as direct trade. Uh, we get deliveries about three times a week mm -hmm. because of how many turn so much. We have to keep organic separated from the rest. Our primary model is one of direct trade or a relationship as it might be called, different different terms, where we go, we, we look for great coffee, and then we try to work out a sustainable agreement together. It's a 24 kilo roaster, so a 50 pound batch at a time. Uh, you do three plus batches an hour. The thing that I think has helped our business a lot is we built on quality coffee, so we're looking for great coffee. So we're trying to find great coffee first. But then we, we want to be able to have a sustainable model where we find a farmer that we can help him be there year after year so we can get that coffee. It's a win-win. I mean, maybe it's selfish on my part, but it's rewarding him. You know, it's like I want him to be there next year, so I want to pay him a fair price so he can be able to be there. We guarantee a minimum of 25% over either the 
fair trade minimum or the C market. So whichever is higher, we'll pay 25% over that. For us consumers, making conscious decisions like choosing to buy fair and direct trade is an important step and can facilitate critical awareness of our unequal global capitalist system. I think it's important to be socially and economically responsible. So you want to give people an opportunity to do the same. It's not a majority of what we sell, but it is a good percentage. It's mm -hmm. not just something that's there. It overall comes up to be about a third of our hot beverage sales are a fair trade product. In our consumerist world, our consumption choices become part of our identity and status. When we buy fair and direct trade, we buy into the marketing and brand power, and we feel good about ourselves. But often our action stops there. If we have an awareness of the problems in the world, and all we have to do is reach for the product on the shelf um, to, to, to be told that we're making a difference, is that where the difference ends? You know. Um, so I worry that, in a way, that being an ethical consumer can shut down one, two other avenues of political activism or change that are very important and necessary to deal with the problems that we have in our globalized society. If I see a sort of paradox in pursuing social change that is designed to address the problems, it makes sense to try to fight those within that very system. By choosing to do that, we are reproducing that system, we're perpetuating it. Um, and even though we may have critiques of it, we're in effect saying, okay, this system can work. Saying that we can affect real change and progress through consumption is sticky for me. There's a lot of examples where the consumer has wielded power and affected change, but it's hard for me, especially as like an environmental analysis major, to say, like, consume more of this better option. <laughs> um, because I'm not convinced that consuming more of anything is going to help us in the long run. It all has to start with the individual. Um, and I think the more and more that the word gets out there uh, to corporations and everybody else, that's great. But it's got to start with the individual. The sort of growth paradigm that we have operated under, as long as I've been alive and as long as most parents and grandparents have been alive, doesn't have to look exactly the way it looks right now. Um, I think that we can sort of grow towards better goals, we can grow towards healthier ecologies, we can grow towards healthier communities. Seeing that there might be a problem in the way that we live is a great first step. And then, you know, maybe you know, making personal choices first that at least are somewhat preferable to other personal choices, like choosing a fair trade or direct trade option, like turning off the lights when you're not in the room, those sort of small personal actions that then maybe snowball into like a campus climate that is aware and active, um, and then as people sort of leave the Claremont bubble and move on into their, whatever they end up doing, um, you know, maybe we can have people making constructive policy, we can have responsible leadership in government, we can have people who are acting ethically. I think all those things you know, are conceivable. I think it's important to recognize how much privilege we have in that we can simply live a consumer lifestyle. Meaning that we, we, can, we don't need to produce much at all of what we need on a daily basis. Um, some of us can get away with never even cooking our own food. And so um, I think that a, an important step in shifting our, our consciousness about these issues is recognizing that we're outsourcing so much responsibility um, for just getting ourselves through our daily lives and that if we take back some of that responsibility, we take back some of the power we've given to global corporations to organize our lives for us and to organize the lives of laborers all around the world. Um, so I think that localization efforts and um, efforts that people make to reduce their consumption and to shift to um, a lifestyle that's more balanced between producing and consuming for your needs um, is an important thing that we all need to do.